recording. Our guest here today is Ard Lewis. Ard received his PhD in 1998 at Cornell University, went on to do a postdoc in Cambridge and stayed there as a Royal Society Research Fellow. Since 2006, he is a professor of theoretical physics here in Oxford, where he leads an interdisciplinary research group focusing on connections between theoretical physics, chemistry, applied math, and biology. A central topic in his research is the study of how complex behavior emerges in systems of many interacting objects. This theme has led him to investigate self-assembling nanostructures, the physics of evolution, and the interplay between Brownian motion and fluid dynamics. Today, he will talk about emergent behavior of a different sort. His talk will discuss some important properties that appear in large-scale artificial neural networks. And so, Art, please take it away when you're ready. Great, uh, Philip, thank you very much for the in invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, so today I want to tell you about um, deep neural networks, one of the main themes of this seminar series, so something I think many of you will know quite a bit about. And I'm going to argue that they have a kind of inbuilt Occam's razor and that this Occam's razor that they have, this implicit bias, is incredibly important to understanding why they work so well. So physicists are taught from a very young age that having more parameters and data points is bad. It's nicely illustrated in this little article by the late Friedman Dyson, where he talks about traveling from Cornell to Chicago to meet Enrico Fermi because he had a very a theory he was very excited about that would explain some aspects of the weak force. And he went to theory, um, Fermi and he showed him his theory and Fermi asked him, well, how many free parameters are there in your theory? And I think there were five, at which Fermi scratched his head and said, you know, my friend Johnny um, von Neumann says that if with four um, parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, I can make it wiggle its tail, which is kind of the ultimate put down in the world of physics because Dyson had put too many parameters into his theory. And in fact, a group um, not too long ago has actually uh, calculated this. And indeed, von Neumann was right, as he often was. And if you look at this little paper, American Journal of Physics, you can indeed make a, an elephant with four parameters and make a wiggle its trunk, in this case, or not its tail, its trunk with five. So the intuition that we have is that you, you know, don't use too many parameters or you're just going to overfit and you're going to get nonsense. I think the intuition goes deeper than that. We, we very are strongly taught that simpler theories are more elegant, more beautiful, and more likely to be true. And that this somehow reflects something about the world. So it's not just an epistemological argument that we use, or something practical, but something ontological we believe is true about the world. Especially theoretical physicists tend to think this way. So that brings us to neural networks, because neural networks are in fact heavily overparameterized. They can have millions or billions of parameters, and typically many, many more parameters than data points. So they're heavily, heavily overparameterized. I'll give you an example of what of the first what why how we might teach a physical undergraduate why overparameterization is bad. So I give you these data points right here. And I fit first this red dash line, which is a five-order polynomial fit, something like this, and I'll get a best fit. When I was on this order, I have some um, bias, I have some variance, but I'm not doing such a bad job, we think, on these points. If, on the other hand, I fit, say, a, a 20th order polynomial, then I can fit the data perfectly, but I'll probably get, I get this widely oscillating behavior, which is probably nonsensical. And in fact, my system is under, is over parameterized. I've got, I can actually fit many, many different versions of this polynomial fit uh, with 20 parameters to this data. And I have no really clear way of adjudicating between which one is correct. I contrast that behavior with a fully connected network with one layer and a thousand hidden units. So many, many more parameters and data points. And this green line shows you a whole series of different numbers of hidden layers from one to five hidden layers. Um, and the neural network gives you this very much more smooth curve. And the question is why did the neural network not give you this very high oscillating curve? Because there are theorems that basically tells that neural networks are hugely highly expressive. In fact, they can be almost perfectly expressive. They can express any function, including polynomials. So a neural network can represent this function, but it's somehow chosen not to, even though you haven't told it to do so. So for physicists, this is very surprising. Here we have the opposite of von Neumann and Fermi's dictum. Um, you have not just a 
you know, enough elephant, enough parameters to make an elephant wiggle its, its tail, but enough parameters to make it do whatever you like. And we haven't done any kind of regularization. We haven't done some kind of trick that limits the number of parameters. And yet we see these neural networks fit this data to what to our eye, to our intuition, seems like the right way of fitting it. And the question is, why does it work? Why does it kind of classic bias variance trade-off that, that you might use to formalize this idea about the number of parameters? Why does it not hold for neural networks? And for that, I want to take a step back first and um, look at a very lovely paper by Lenka Zdorva from Paris uh, that came out in Nature Physics recently. And she says this, to understand deep learning, the machine learning community needs to fill the gap between the mathematically rigorous works and the end product driven engineering process, all of which keep scientific rigor intact. And this is where the physics approach and experience comes in handy. The virtue of physics research is that it strives to design and perform refined experiments that reveal unexpected yet reproducible behavior. It has a framework to critically re-examine and improve theories explaining the empirical observed behavior. And so what she points out in this little commentary is that the field is somewhat split between mathematicians who are focusing on rigor and engineers who just want things to work. And there's a gap in between to explain big questions. And the one of the big questions she mentions is one that is an old one. In fact, in 1995, she says, the influential statistician Leo Breitman summarized three main open problems in machine learning theory. And I'll just list one. Why don't heavily overparameterized neural networks overfit the data is the question that she's asking is that he asked in 1995, so quite a long time ago, 25 years ago. And she points out these are still open to today and subject to the most ongoing work of most of the ongoing works in the machine learning community. So this question about why do overparameterized neural networks not overfit is an old one and is still in this very recent article considered to be an unsolved problem. Now I'm gonna take a typical physics approach. And one of the things that, that um, um, Zadora says in this paper is that we ought to look for models like the Ising model that physicists like to use, some kind of simple models that will give us some kind of understanding of what's happening. So I'm going to give you what I'm going to call the Ising model of neural network of supervised learning. And this is a little model problem. And we'll call this a doctor's decision table for COVID-19 to make it practical. So let's say you are a doctor and uh, I present you with some symptoms and I, the doctor may be asked to Seven, we have seven questions we can ask you. Do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Have you lost your sense of smell? Are you old? Do you have a heart problem? Are you obese? Do you have diabetes? If all those things are true, the doctor may say, I'm gonna send you to the hospital. If those things are true, but you're young, the doctor may say, well, um, what about your, do you have any comorbidities? If you have a bunch of comorbidities, the doctor might still send you to the hospital. If you have these symptoms, but you're young and otherwise healthy, the doctor may say, sorry, mate, stick it out at home, etc." You can imagine, that these, there's lots of different ways these, these symptoms can present. And so the, one of the questions you might have is you have a doctor who you watch for a certain amount of time answering questions. And then the question would be, can a machine algorithm and neural network learn from a certain subset of the answers the doctor has given what the doctor's answers will be on any possible set of these uh, answers? Now, we can think about this a little bit more formally there's a, this is basically a function. So if I look at all possible um, outputs that the doctor gives to the set of seven questions, one of those outputs, that's a function. It takes all the inputs of which there are two to the power of seven because each of these questions can be zero or one possible answers. So each function takes 120 inputs and maps it onto a yes or a no to send you to the hospital. And then question, how many functions are there? Well, there's two to the two to the n possible functions, the two to the 128 possible functions, which is basically three times 10 to the 38. So although this problem may seem relatively small, the number of possible answers that a doctor could give to the set of all possible questions is 10 to the 38, it's very, very large. And so a question might be, how does a machine learning algorithm learn this and how does it um, do well? Because typically they do well on relatively small amounts of data. How do they pick between all these different functions which they can represent? And so to do this, I'm going to look at a, a um, I'm going to think about these neural networks as mappings. So here's a little example of a neural network with one with two layers. And you may remember you have inputs, you've got weights, these are the multiplied, and there's some offsets. At the end, you may have some nonlinearity, I say a softmax, which gives you an output. So if we have the space of all functions the, map can, the model can represent, so in this case, the two to the 128 possible functions, and the model has 
your neural network has a bunch of parameters in it, then we can drive a parameter function map as a map from the set of parameters of this model. So all the, double, the little w's and b's that you put in there to the function space. And so a certain set of parameters will give you a certain function. So if a neural network has a certain set of weights, given all the 120 inputs, it's going to give you a yes or a no to send you to the hospital. That's what we call, um, what we just wrote the, just two years ago, we call this the, the parameter function map. And this is helpful as an abstraction because I can then study this parameter function map. So what happens if I randomly pick parameters? What kind of functions am I going to find? And what my student Guillermo found, which was perhaps somewhat surprising at first sight, was if I randomly sample parameters, then what I find is that although there are 10 to the 34 possible functions or three times 10 to the 34 possible functions, I don't find the functions with equal probability. I find certain functions with much higher probability. In fact, this one here, I find 10% of the time. That's a function that just all zeros are all ones. It basically says send everybody to the hospital or send nobody to the hospital. And then as I um, keep sampling, I find a bunch of these functions which have remarkably high probabilities compared to the mean probability of 10 to the minus 39. So what we find here is basically that uh, the if you randomly sample parameters, certain functions are much more likely to appear than others. And I'll show you for a bit later that, in fact, we can have a theory for this that predicts that those functions which are simple, and simple in this case means they've got a short description. So if everything is all zero, everything's all one, the description of that is make everything zero, make everything one. It's a short description. It's called Mogorov simple. That can be approximated by some compressor. So we compress these with the lempel ziv complexity, which is a measure of the simplicity. And what we do is that we find that simple functions that are high probability functions are all simple. So in other words, this particular neural network has an intrinsic bias towards simple functions. They're much more likely to make simple functions than complex functions. And does that help with generalization is then the question. And the answer is yes. So here we have a whole bunch of different target functions. By target function, I mean, I have a doctor that has to give a certain set of answers. You know, a very simplistic doctor sends everybody to the hospital or nobody to the hospital. And as the doctors get more sophisticated, they have more complicated answers. And what you see is that for these simple target functions, simple sets of answers to the questions, this is the generalization error the neural network gives if I give it just half of the question of the of the um, of the set of answers. So if I have half of the set of possible answers, which is 64, and then I see how well it does on the other 64, if the function is simple, the neural network actually makes relatively small errors, you know, 5%, 10% type of errors, which is remarkably good given how, how much how many possible functions there are. The interesting thing is if I give you 64 inputs. And then I ask you what, how many functions are there? There are, there are actually still two to the 64 functions that will fit that data because I can be anything else on the, un, on the unseen data. If I pick one of those functions at random, which is what a very stupid learner would do, then what you see is that basically the error I get is 50%. So the vast majority of functions that fit the data give me bad generalization, but these simple functions to which the neural network is biased give me good generalization. Here's another way of looking at it. I have the generalization error for a target that has this complexity. And each of these little dots is what the neural network does upon training by SGD for a different random starting position. You see, most of the time, it finds a set of relatively simple functions, which is a good thing. Whereas the random learner, learner which picks a function at random, just finds a, a, a bunch of random functions, none of which generalize very well. If I have, an, I contrast a very complex function that I'm trying to learn, then neither my neural network nor my random learner do particularly well. So neural networks have this inbuilt Occam's razor. They work well on structured data. Let's take a step back and think about our doctor who's answering questions about patients. Well, you probably already saw some patterns in that in those answers. Like if the person is old, very likely to send to the hospital. If they're young, only send to the hospital if they've got comorbidities, for example. And so there's these patterns there tell you that the data is that the kinds of answers doctors are telling you are simple compared to the a full set of 10 to the 38 functions that they could give. So therefore, a bias towards simplicity is helpful if you are looking at structured data. And the claim would be that most of the data that we have is in fact structured in one way or the other. Now, where, why is there simplicity bias in this parameter function map? Well, we can we showed, showed it empirically in the previous slide by um, just simply sampling. Um, he's a very bright undergraduate student, now a DPhil student with us, with us, Chris Mingard, who came to me and um, worked out a proof for some simple networks that you can show 
for example, that if you have a, a, a perceptron, which is kind of the simplest network, and you randomly sample the parameters, then if you look at that output and you count the number of zeros and ones, then the, you're equally likely to get all zeros as one one, as two ones, as three ones, as four ones. But of course, there's many, many ways to put 64 ones into a string of 128. It just tells you the individual strings that are simple are much more likely with low entropy are much more likely to appear than high entropy strings. And we've been able to prove mathematically that this um, bias only gets stronger as you increase the number of layers. I've just put in here three red lines because these are three undergraduates from Hartford where I'm affiliated who did this really beautiful work. Now, I wanted to actually ask a bigger question. So we are able to prove this for these very simple neural networks, but do we expect this to be more generally true? So I've used this Occam's razor. Um, I should probably spell Occam slightly better here, Occam. And uh, William Occam was a, a Franciscan monk, a scholastic scholar who lived quite a long time ago, also part, part of the time, most likely in Oxford and possibly at Merton College. It's still contested whether he was there or not. And his most famous statement is, entities are not to be multiplied without necessity, which is actually only a, appears in about 1639 in a commentary by John Punch on uh, Don Scotus, another scholastic. What Ockham actually said in his, in his, what he found in his text is this little quote, which basically means plurality is not to be posted without necessity. And in fact, if you look through history, you'll find that Plato, Aristotle, all the way through that the idea that simple explanations are better than complex ones or that you shouldn't multiply explanations without necessity is very common. There's lots of modern approaches to this. There's a very nice Bayesian approach by David Mackay, which I don't actually think is correct, but it's interesting. There's, I'll show you a, 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 in a moment something from algorithmic information theory, but it's still contested. And philosophers have looked at this, and as not ex unexpectedly, philosophers, they um, very strongly disagree with one another, but they have some very interesting things to say about this idea of Occam's razor. But what, regardless of whether the reason for Occam's razor is not so clear, in practice, we know that it works remarkably well. And so the fact that these neural networks appear to have a bias towards simple functions is something that I would like to ask, is this more general? And so why do they exhibit this inbuilt Occam's razor? Is this a more general property? And so what I am um, going to try to explain to you is an intuition that comes from the famous trope of monkeys on keyboards. So here's a chimpanzee on a word processor. I used to use typewriters, but I realized that the younger people in the audience don't know what those things are. So the input is equal to the output. How likely is a monkey to type the first say 10,000 digits of pi, well, it's one over the number of keys to the power of the length plus one, because you've got to get three points. The fact is this string is equally likely as any other string of that length. They're all equally likely or unlikely because the, they're all, there's a uniform likelihood of getting any string of a certain length. What if instead of typing into a, a word processor, the monkey is typing into a computer program like C? Well, then interestingly, there are short, codes that will generate C. This is from um, Dick Winter uh, in, at, in Amsterdam, 133 character code that will generate the first 15,000 digits of pi using a spigot algorithm. The monkey might by accident type this code and suddenly pi will come out. This tells us that if you're thinking about monkeys typing into some kind of computer, then there are certain types of outputs like pi or like 010101, which is print 01 X number of times, which will appear much more likely than other strings that are truly random of that length. And this intuition has been formalized in a beautiful piece of mathematics that's often called algorithmic information theory. And here are two of its founders called McGurrow and Chatham, who basically point out that if I have an individual string, I could describe this complexity as the shortest program on a universal Turing machine that generates that string. Universal Turing machine is, is an idea from Alan Turing, a machine that can do any possible calculation. And because it's universal, because if you can do any possible calculation, then um, if I have a universal machine or another universal machine, they can always be written, one can always compile to the other one. So this description is fundamentally in, asymptotically independent of the actual machine that I use. And the intuition is if I have a string like, like this, 0101, which is just print 0 and 50 times, it has local growth complexity, it's simple. Whereas this string below it, to my knowledge, is, has no shorter code than just print the string. Now, the warning is that I don't know whether this, there might not be some code that can, can produce this string. And formally, global complexity is uncomputable. 
because it reduces to the halting problem reduces to um, Gödel's undecidability theorem. But this gives, in spite of the fact that I can't calculate Kolmogorov growth complexity, I can approximate it, and it still gives me some interesting intuitions, such as a random number is defined as any number for which the shortest, which has a Kolmogorov growth complexity equal or longer to itself. So in other words, there's no shorter description than just print the number. Or the complexity of a set can be much less than the individual elements of a set. So if I give you all the numbers from one to Googleplex, then that's a very short description. But individual numbers in that sequence can be very complex. And I'm going to use that intuition in just a minute. The link to the monkey theorem really comes from Ray Solmonoff, the third founder of AIT, who was thinking, in fact, before Kolmogorov and Chaitin, about what happens if I put random programs into a universal Turing machine. So I'm going to have a for simplicity universal Turing machine that only takes binary inputs. It's a prefix code, which means it doesn't machine, which is only it can you it can easily de decode. There's no special um, code words need to tell me it's the end of a program. So I just look at all the inputs. And then I ask myself, how likely am I to produce a certain output x, like pi? Well, I'll sum over all programs that generate pi. The probability of getting a program of length L is one half to the power of the length. And so that's all the, the sum over all those programs give me the probability of getting pi. And the shortest one, which is the Kolmogorov complexity, is the most likely one that I'm going to get. This has already given me some intuition that smaller, simpler sequences are much more likely to appear than more complex sequences if I randomly type into some kind of algorithm generating machine. And in fact, Marvin Minsky, one of the founders of, of modern AI, said not long before he died, it seems to me that the most important discovery since Gödel was discovered by Chaitin, Solomonov, and Kolmogorov of the concept called algorithmic probability, which is what this is. Everyone should learn all about that and spend the rest of their lives working on it. A bit of hyperbole, maybe, but I think the ideas behind this are super interesting. The next person is uh, Leon Levin, also known for uh, P versus NP, who proved in the 1970s, in fact, that not only was this a lower bound, because this, this is at least one program that will generate X, but it's also an upper bound asymptotically. And that's extremely powerful. This idea that if you randomly type into some kind of computer program, you're, you're exponentially more likely to get outputs that are simple, turns out to be a, a bound on the top and the bottom. Now, you might wonder why you were not taught this as an undergraduate in physics, because it's such a powerful theorem. And the reason is, is because, well, this only holds for universal Turing machines, and many systems of interest are not universal. Kolmogorov complexity is formally incomputable, and it only holds in the limit of very large x, because asymptotically, these order one terms are terms like terms, are compiler terms are fixed, but you don't know how big they are. And so for these reasons, these ideas have largely languished a little bit in the field of theoretical computer science and mathematics. Now, I got very interested in this, actually one of my students pointed out to me, because we were, we were finding a lot of simplicity bias empirically, trying to figure out where it came from. And so we have a much simpler proof that isn't as powerful, but is much more general, where you say, let's say I have some input output map. Okay, I can generate any output with the following algorithm. Run all inputs into my map and give all outputs, count how frequently the outputs appear, encode the outputs by Shannon Fanner alias code, which is the most efficient way of describing this kind of um, entropic code. And this will give me a bound of my Kolmogorov complexity, because this is one of the ways I can generate my outputs. And if my map is simple, it's order one term, then it won't grow with size, then I can rewrite this as an upper bound on my probability of getting x, because I, I have 2 to the minus k of x given f and given n. Okay, so it's not full Kolmogorov complexity, it's Kolmogorov complexity given to, it's a conditional Kolmogorov complexity. And for the people that are interested, you can read more about this in our paper. We basically show that if the map is simple and there's certain constraints on the map, then in fact, up to order one terms again, this conditional Kolmogorov complexity is equal to the true Kolmogorov complexity. Um, we still know how to calculate Kolmogorov complexity, but what we do is a typical physicist approach and say, look, I can work out asymptotically what this should look like. We're used to many things that we can formally show asymptotically have a certain type of scaling behavior still holding outside of the bit where we can formally prove it. And we're used to the idea that we might make some approximations and then add in a, a parameter to correct for that. So here, I'm going to take some approximation in case it will wiggle to the true Kolmogorov complexity and give a prefactor, which captures multiplicative constants and an offset, which, which captures additive constants. And um, for what we show is for maps that are simple, this should work um, well as a bound on the 
um, probability that you're going to get a certain output. And here, just very briefly, I show you a whole bunch of different maps that I'll show this. Um, here's a map from RNA, which I'll talk about in just a second. Here, for example, here, I'll give you this, I'll talk about this example. Here are, uh, these are what are called L systems, which are used, actually comes usually from Utrecht, where I was an undergraduate from a, a botanist there called Astrid Lindemeyer, L systems. And it describes, um, it's used to make um, plant shapes. And it's also using computer graphics. And so if you just randomly pick um, rules in the world of L systems, then you're going to find simple shapes much more frequently than complex shapes. And this line is our predicted um, uh, upper bound on the complexity. Um, and here's a set of differential equations. A whole series of systems work that way. But fascinatingly, the reason I got into this was because I was studying some evolutionary pro uh, problems. So there's a mapping from RNA sequences. So here's a, RNA has this four letter alphabet, it has a sequences, and some RNAs are coding. But a lot of RNAs can also be functional, and they may be catalysts, or they may be um, they may have some kind of structural role. And then it really matters what shape they fold into. So this sequence here will fold into particular shapes, say this particular um, catalyst. Um, I, solving from this to this is, is complicated, but so going, although neural networks might solve that problem, uh, watching what happened to protein folding recently at DeepMind. But we can solve a simpler problem quite easily, which is from this to secondary structure. It tells us basically what the bonding pattern is. And what's kind of interesting is here we found that if we randomly pick sequences of RNA, then we're exponentially more likely to get simple secondary structures than complicated secondary structures. So they're much more likely to get simple ones and complex ones. And what's fascinating is when we then look at nature, so here are um, length 100 RNAs, of which there are 932 that have been found in nature to be non-coding, to be some, some kind of functional effect. Here's the probability of finding them, the green dots are the probability of finding them in nature. And this is their complexity, so how complex they are. And this is our bounds. So you see that the most common ones found in nature are in fact simple ones. And the ones that are less likely to be found in nature are significantly more rare. So nature evolution is always also following this inbuilt Occam's razor and you're seeing simple things appear more likely than complex things. This is how we got into it. And then we realized this applies to neural networks as well. And here's just an example from one of many examples. I showed you the simplicity bias in the Boolean system. Here I'm showing you for a, a convolutional neural network on C410. The argument being that this basically, uh, this um, uh, bias works for a wide range of different networks. And it works for, it's, it's a very general, general argument and therefore it should hold for a wide range of neural networks. Now, some people in the audience are probably wondering why I slipped something under the rug, which I absolutely did, which is the following. You know, neural networks are not, are not trained by randomly sampling parameters, which is what we did to get these, these probabilities of function, these priors, as it were. They're trained by something called stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent is a method that follows gradients down on a, on a loss landscape. And actually, in the field, I'd say the dominant hypothesis for why neural networks work so well in the over-parameter regime is that there's some kind of magic to SGD. And one of my main claims today is that this is not true. Okay, that there's nothing magic about SGD, and SGD itself uh, does not give any extra implicit bias that, that explains the fundamental problem of why do these things work in the over-parameter regime. And the intuition behind that goes a little bit as follows. I've just told you that the probability of getting a function goes scales exponentially with a linear change in its complexity. So imagine I've got some loss function here, okay, and some zero errors. I come look at classification. Then down here, this is roughly the probability that I find a set of parameters that give me zero error on this for this particular um, training set. I can have many different functions. As I said, there's many functions. There's a lot of redundancies. So function one, function two, function three. If function one has a larger basin size, a larger probability of of getting it upon random sampling, then SGD is much more likely to have a, have a basin of attraction that is also large. So SGD is much more likely to fall into these that is to fall into these um, basins. That's actually an idea that we first um, worked out in evolutionary theory in these RNA systems a number of years ago. And we showed that this works remarkably well for evolutionary dynamics. And so we just recently with um, uh, shown, again, with two undergraduates from Hartford involved shown that this same principle, the same dynamical principle holds for um, SGD. 
It's not to say the SGD doesn't you know, feel dot subtleties of the landscape or that if you can tweak hyperparameters, you don't get slightly different behavior, but this is the dominant behavior that you get when the volumes of your basins of attraction vary over many orders of magnitude. And what I'm gonna do next is, is go a bit more in this function-based picture. I've been a bit vague on what I mean by a function. So for the, actually for the Boolean system, it's relatively straightforward. A function is what, what the outputs are on all the inputs. For something like MNIST here, which are a bunch of um, handwritten images, you know, 28 by 28 with 256 um, values of each pixel, there's, a, there's an hyper astronomically large number of possible inputs. So what I'll do is I'll just define my functions as a fixed, in, a fixed set of inputs, which could be say my training set and my test set. My function is simply what does, does my neural network give as a function of parameters on these? So if I have these images that I feed into a neural network, if it gives me 50419, which is correct, zero errors, that's one function. If it gives me 50479, to use this for a seven, I have one error, that's a different function. So I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna represent my functions um, given a certain uh, set of inputs as to what the labels are, for example, for classification. And that's helpful because I can start thinking about things like Bayesian um, arguments. So here's a classic Bayes theorem, right? The posterior is given by this, this little combination of the likelihood and the prior divided by the marginal likelihood or the evidence. The prior of functions this is the thing we just looked at before. How likely am I to get a function? In this case, upon random sampling of parameters. The likelihood, so how likely am I to get this function given the data, right? Well, if I train to zero error, which is very easy to do with neural networks because they're so highly expressive, then this takes on a particularly simple form, which is one if the function uh, gives me zero error and zero otherwise. Um, and that means that I get something very simple. Um, I get a posterior, which is directly proportional to my prior, just divided by this constant, which is my marginal likelihood. The marginal likelihood is then simply this, you know, it's the, I marginalize out over um, all possible functions. It's the sum over the priors of all functions that give me zero error on the training set. So total probability of all functions that give me zero training on the error set. So it's really nice. In this picture, I suddenly have a, a pretty concrete way of applying Bayes' theorem. And I'm going to be interested in how likely am I to get a certain function given that I train on a certain training set. That's the kind of Bayesian picture for supervised learning. And so what we showed was, I think, something quite surprising to me at first, which is here on the y-axis, I say how likely I am to get a certain function on MNIST. So here I've got 100 images of MNIST. I train on a test training set of, of 10,000, but because I always train to zero error, the first 10,000 images are always identical. So the functions only differ on the 100 that I do in the test set that I haven't trained on. And what you see here is that this particular function is the most likely function to appear. It's a function with one error. And this is the probability that I get it on, but, for SGD, so I keep running, I, I, run, I run 10 to the, I may say a million different SGD runs with different initial um, uh, random seeds. And this is the most likely function, then these are less likely functions to get. And this is a probability that I get it upon random sampling of parameters. Now, I don't actually do random sampling parameters because it's too expensive for this, this for network. We use a Gaussian processes to calculate this. Um, and this is last week's beautiful talk by Yasha Sol Dickstein showed us that in the infinite limit, these networks are equal to Gaussian processes. And we can we figured out how to use that to calculate basically this, this posterior on um, this um sorry, the uh the um yeah, the Bayesian posterior. And so what's fascinating is that the probability that a stochastic gradient sense converges on a particular function is simply given by the probability that it, you get it upon random sampling of functions. And here actually I'm just showing you the probability of functions for all possible functions. And if there's a hundred images on my test set, then there's, if I, I binarize them actually in this case, so there's two to the hundred uh, possible different functions. The, the vast majority of these functions are extremely unlikely to appear. And what you're seeing here is this very small subset of functions which have low error, um, which are the high probability ones that both SGD and, um, and random sampling would converge on. So in other words, SGD is behaving like a Bayesian optimizer. It's giving you functions with a probability purport very closely predicted by the, um, the, the posterior. So there's two kinds of questions really about generalization. Why do neural networks generalize at all in the overparameterized regime where classical learning theory tells us they shouldn't? Well, they do that because they're highly biased towards simple solutions and because SGD basically follows that bias. 
There's a different kind of question you might ask, which is that given that it generalizes well, can I further improve the performance by fine tuning hyperparameters? And the answer is yes. And that's an interesting question, but I don't think there's any universal answers there, even though in practice, this may be super interesting or helpful. I just wanna give you one example of where you might look at these second order effects. So here's a convolution neural network. Now we know that one of the ways we can improve CNN behavior on images is by something called pooling. And here you see, I just highlighted the probability of the zero error function with no pooling. And then here is, um, this is on fashion MNIST, uh, sorry, not on MNIST, fashion MNIST. And here is the um, probability on um, with pooling. And you see that both the, the SGD and the Bayesian probabilities increase um, upon pooling, which is the kind of things that you do to fix, make your network work better. So this is basically uh, um, uh, an example of how you what I call second order effects. Given that it works well, can you make it work better? But primarily what you're seeing here is that the SGD is following on the, um, uh, the Bayesian prediction. So the question then is, can I break simplicity bias? Okay, I've told you simplicity bias is the reason why this thing generalizes as well. It's the reason why even though I can, it's highly over-parameterized and have many possible functions, it picks these low, um, these simple functions. Right? Is what it does. So the question is, can I break the simplicity bias? And uh, one of the things that we uh, know is that neural networks exhibit an order to chaos transition. This is something that actually also Yasha and others worked on. And for tench nonlinearities, there's an ordered regime and a chaotic regime, particularly for wider initializations. Relus don't have this problem uh, or, or this feature, as it were, that tensions do. And so we can use this because we are are um, our simplicity bias arguments break down for these kinds of chaotic systems. So we expect the simplicity bias to break down. And indeed, this is what happens. So as you increase the width of the initialization, you go into the chaotic regime. What you see, actually Greg Yang from Microsoft was the one who pointed this out to us first, although we should have known, is that the as you increase the width going to the chaotic regime, your simplicity bias disappears. The bias towards simple functions is gone. And uh, so that's super interesting. So here I can, you see this as well in just a, a, a rank plot. So I rank the functions by probability. So here I've got a more chaotic and less and a non-chaotic system. And I'm gonna, for the, the Boolean system, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. This line was the one you saw before. And this is for the more chaotic systems, the system that's less biased towards simple functions. And you see that it just generalizes much worse on, on these simple targets. And the reason is, is because it's not biased for simple targets, it's, it's got, um, it's, it's not very biased, it's not nearly as strongly biased. And so because there are so many functions possible, it picks by kind of entropy argument, the vast majority of functions don't generalize well, and that's what it finds. And you can see this as well here with these same little scatter plots. Here's the generalization error. Here's the, the complexity of the solution that you find. And then you run this thing many, many times and you see what kind of solutions it finds. And the normal bias network for this simple function finds lots of simple solutions um, on average close to the, the true um, function of your target. Whereas the chaotic one, even though the target is here, is mainly finding these complex solutions because there are way more complex solutions than there are simple. They're exponentially more complex solutions than simple solutions. So by entropy, just that wins. Whereas if I give it a complex target, then they both don't do very well and they both tend to um, uh, uh, give not such good generalization because there's no, no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and so complex targets is where these things don't work so well. Now, in that article um, by Zedemorova, Zedemorova, you saw that she, I, I didn't mention it at the time, but I did put the picture up. One of the things she also points out is that, you know, for physicists to think about this, they got to look at not only the algorithm, but also at the data, at the structured data. And so what's nice about this Bayesian picture is I can look at the data. So now looking at this Boolean system again, I have a target function. So a particular uh, answer that my doctor gives, which is around here, a middle, middle, middle to high complexity target function. And what I do here is I pick a whole bunch of random functions and I simply calculate what their error is compared to this target function. And uh, you see that there's a whole bunch of functions here that give uh, uh, that on this, uh, that have this complexity. And this is the one with the lowest error. The one minus the error is what I plot. Um, and this is this envelope gives me all the different um, things that my network does. This tells me something about how my networking engages with the data. 
And this is just Bayes' theorem, but now I'm going to average this over different training sets. So I'm going to do it not just for one training set as in before, but I'm going to average over many training sets. And then, of course, my function um, may, may or may not give me zero error on the training sets. And the probability that it gives me zero error is one minus the error that it gives of the function to the power, that, so the mean error that it gives um, to the power m, because I've got to pick m instances of, of, um, of data points. And so that's what is now my, my, um, my likelihood has now become uh, not well, zero, 1, but now 1 minus epsilon to the power m. This is a, the average likelihood I have to average over all, um, all training sets. And the, once, the reason there's an approximate here is because I've done a slightly dirty trick, which is I've taken the, the average um, of the ratio and replaced that by the ratio of the averages. And it's, uh, the reason for that is because we're pretty sure that the marginal likelihood does not vary a lot from um, test sets to test sets. So this should be a relatively good approximation. Let me, we're going to test this. This is how we look at the data. Since the, um, this one minus epsilon is, is to the power m, which is the size of your training sets, the, the things that are going to dominate are the smallest error functions for each complexity. So I'm only going to look at the best functions for each one. That's an approximation that shouldn't be too, such a bad approximation. So here I show how that looks for, for a simple target. Um, as a function of the, um, so here is for m is one, this is one minus epsilon, but as I go to higher powers of m, right, then the further, the, the worse my error gets penalized by this, this um, exponential power. And you see that as I increase the size of my training sets, what this shows me is that as I train a large and large training sets, the functions that I would normally find um, are constrained by the training sets to functions that are closer to the target function. And this happens for different complexities of targets. So that's the, uh, the one part of my Bayesian, uh, my, my, my Bayes theorem. Now I want to look at the prior. I already talked about priors before. The difficulty is if I want to look at all priors, priors on all functions, some of these priors for these more rare functions are extremely hard to calculate a priori. So I'm going to do something slightly simpler. And this is what my student Henry, another undergraduate came up with. He said, well, why don't we just look instead of the probability of the functions, let's just look at the probability as a function of the complexity that's much easier to calculate. So here is a typical probability, how likely you are to get a certain complexity upon random sampling. Although there are exponentially more functions with high complexity because it's basically biased, I'm much likely to get each individual one. So on average, I get something which is relatively flat. And what I see is, you know, for this um, uh, normal simplicity bias system, I get a, a complexity distribution which is relatively flat. Whereas if I go to a chaotic system, which I am down here, so um, a chaotic system, where I don't have simplicity bias, then what I see is that my probability of getting um, of my network producing high complexity outputs becomes very large because there are many more of them. And so I can that's how I can calculate my, my P of K. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for, try to calculate my posterior by multiplying my at my my prior and my um and my uh, likelihood in this um in these approximated ways. Okay, so I've got this is my prior, this is my likelihood as a function of the, um, uh, which goes, and so the only, only place where training comes in is how it affects this one minus of sign on this error part. So it's the data, this is how the data and the training interact with the system. And this P of K is basically the prior, the, the, the bias that my network has towards certain types of functions. And so what I see here is for a non-chaotic network or a chaotic network, okay, so many, as you, as you add, the, as you increase the number of layers, it becomes more likely to be chaotic. This is the, for this particular target, this is the um, histogram of how likely I am to get certain complexity of, of functions if I randomly uh, train, if I train with SGD for my uh, normal network, and this is for my chaotic network, so the one that doesn't have simplicity bias. And as you see it, as I've seen before, you tend to get these more complex uh, solutions. And what's nice about this, I show this for three different target functions. Here is the um, normal one, a normal network. This is the chaotic network, the P of K, right? So this, this is the one minus epsilon factor. This is the P of K. And here is for a simple target. This is what I get from my approximation, P of K times one minus epsilon. This is what I get from directly sampling, right? So actually just running the network on SGD. You see that I make this, even though those approximations are relatively crude, my predictions are remarkably good. These are my predictions on the top. The bottom is what I get from running SGD. Right? So the predictions are just when taking P of K, there's nothing with SGD in there, the bottom one is SGD. So I'm able to predict with a simple theory pretty well what the distribution of functions I, I'm going to get given different targets. And so 
That's super interesting because I think I've explained here, I've given you, a, um, I've shown you that you need that simplicity bias for these things to generalize well, and I've shown I can break it. Not only can I break it, but I can actually explain to you how the data interacts with the, um, the prior for this um, Ising model of neural networks, namely the, the Boolean system. So then the question is, can you work this on larger now, um, more complicated data sets? So here's MNIST, that image, those, those are numbers again, the classic data set. And here you see as a function of the width. So as you go this direction, you get more, comp you get more um, chaotic. As you make the network deeper, chaos sets in earlier. And so what you see here is for MNIST, this is the, the generalization error for this particular system. And as you go into chaotic regime, the generalization starts to decline very rapidly, just like you saw for the, um, for the, uh, the Boolean system. Now, I don't really know what the complexity of my targets are because the targets, I don't, really, I don't have a clear idea exactly what target is, except that I want to give the right labels on the images. But what I do see is if I look at the complexity of the solutions that I find for normal MNIST, a normal network, sorry, no part of me, a normal um, network, which is not chaotic, compared to a more chaotic one, the chaotic one indeed finds much more complex networks. And here I'm using something called um, critical sample ratio, which is an approximation to the complexity of the functions that are being found. So the guy gets exactly the same story. I'm finding uh, much more uh, complex functions when, when I'm in the Celtic regime. And here's the prior PFK calculated for MNIST using the same complexity measure. And this is for the normal network, and it's for the Celtic network. And you see that the prior functions that I'm getting are much more skewed towards complex functions. And if I corrupt the data now, so now in order to make a more complex target function, I'm going to corrupt the data. So I'm going to mess up some of the labels. Then what I see, as I saw on exactly the same phenomenology I saw on the on the Boolean system, that the uh, the complexity of the of the functions found goes up, the error goes up as well. If I get to a very complex data set, then basically my my simplicity bias is not helping me very much anymore at all. My generalization is almost the same as a chaotic one. It's exactly so this, the phenomenology here is exactly the same as I'm able to calculate with my Bayesian picture for the um, the Boolean system. So that's, and if I do it for C4, I can do the same, just I can do the same thing. So it's not something particular to MNIST. So to summary then, my Bayesian picture gives me this, uh, um, this very nice uh, story, which tells me that I've got, I need to have bias, simplicity bias. If I break simplicity bias, I don't generalize as well. And then I can look at the data. And what I see is that as I increase the number of training sets, basically the, the probability that I, that I get a certain function, so the probability that I converge on a certain function goes that goes down uh, um, at the, uh, far away from my target function and goes and is maximized towards where my target function sits. And that is that, that training. The whole all the training is is one minus epsilon to the power f. So I've been able to kind of separate out these different aspects of what a neural network does. The data is this bit right here, and network and the algorithm are basically this bit right here. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a little bit more of a specialized topic. If you start delving into this world of generalization, then you'll find there's a, there's a very, very voluminous literature on bounds. This is really frequent, this kind of picture. And what people have been trying to do for a long time is to calculate um, rigorous bounds on the generalization error that you get for certain hypotheses. And you'll, if you in this literature, you'll, you may have heard this. Pack learning, um, VC dimension, Rademacher complexity. So there's a whole literature and language around this. This is like a classic, a very famous bound uh, on VC dimension. It tells you that you can um, bound the error that you're going to get on a certain hypothesis by the, the VC dimension of the whole hypothesis class. So we've just recently, with my student Guillermo, to understand this literature, partially because we kept being asked by people in the field how our work linked to this. Um, we've done a big review paper on uh, all of the bounds that we could find that we thought were interesting. Here we have a, we've got the classification of all the different possible bounds where they fit into a classification of um, from the simplest bounds, but also the easiest to make rigorous to the more complicated bounds that take algorithm and data into account, therefore harder to calculate. And uh, we've given also serial desiderata for these bounds. I think what's quite exciting is that we, we've used something called a pack base bound, um, which is fundamentally frequent this idea, but has a Bayesian type connotations. That was called, that David McAllister uh, on at uh, Chicago came up with, which basically gives you the error, um, the, the predicted error on your uh, test set in terms of KL divergence of, of two different distributions. And one thing we were able to we were able to prove in our paper is that the KL divergence 
if you use a function-based description is always less than the KL divergence that you would get if you use a parameter-based description, which tells us that if you want to make these bounds, you shouldn't use you shouldn't really look at the parameters so much of your system, but try to look at functions, which is not what people have done. And what we have derived a function-based bound. So here's our version of the pack base bound with a function parameters. And the main thing you see here is that we bound the error, um, given that you get zero error on the training set by some terms, these little M and N terms are terms you can largely ignore. It goes one over the size of your training set. And this is the uh, marginal likelihood of, um, of your system. The marginal likelihood is very nice because it includes both the data and the set of all possible functions that you find. And what we're able to predict is here is the, um, for example, the generalization error of a fully connected network as a function of label corruption. So as you corrupt labels in an image data sets for here MNIST and this more complicated data set up here, this green one is CIFAR, which is a more complicated images. And these, these dashed lines are the SGD results and these um, solid lines are our predictions from the from the um, from this bound, um, which has no no free parameters. It's just you're just making a, a a hard prediction, and so this works actually remarkably well. When I say remarkably well, is because until recently people made a big deal of having a bound that even gives you a value uh, on say on binary classification of less than one, let alone something that actually follows the data this carefully. You can also look at something like this learning curve. So how does the error vary as you increase the size of your training sets? And one super interesting thing that people have found is that if you look at as the, this is your, your generalization error as a function of the size of your training sets, then for a wide range of different um, data sets, you find this kind of almost um, this dashed lines of the, or the SGD results, you find this scaling like behavior that seems to be mainly dependent on the data and not on the network. And so here are a whole bunch of different, um, a whole bunch of different uh, neural networks, everything from a fully connected network to a mobile net to a dense net. And the top line is our bounds that we calculate directly with no fitting parameters. And you see that we're able to reproduce these exponents, you know, not, not too badly. And so very excited about this. This is on a log scale, where, uh, so we're actually doing remarkably well because these learning curves are very important. It tells you if I, you know, if I double my my test set, which may be a lot of, my training set part of me, which may be a lot of work, how much gain do I get in my generalization error? And we're able to at least reproduce this. We haven't been able to explain exactly why it's a scaling behavior yet, but we did reproduce this with this much simpler description. We can also look at comparing things across different types of networks. So here you see CNN with no pooling, here's CNN with max pooling. Um, sorry, the other way around, this is uh, no pooling and this is max pooling and the error goes down in the real system that goes down in our bounds. Here you see as you increase the number of uh, layers, typically neural networks generalize better. That's what the neural network does on MNIST. And this is what our bound does. Um, and here we compare a whole bunch of different, um, here we compare the generalization error versus the bound for a whole bunch of different networks. So this is a large error for mobile net, which is a small network. And this is dense nets, which work better. And we're able to, um, for these state of the art um, um, networks, we're able to more or less predict what their generation error is going to be a priori. So we're very pleased. And we think this is by far the, by far the best bound on the market. And it means that we've explained something about the generalization of neural networks. And what's really important is our bound simply uses this marginal likelihood. So there's nothing about SGD in there. It's basically just summing over all probabilities of getting functions that give you zero training on the error sets. And, um, and that, that thing is enough to give you the prediction of how an SGD trained neural networks work. In other words, this, um, uh, this tells us this function-based story is, is capturing something, the essence of what makes a neural network generalize. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, um, I've talked, told you that neural networks generalize because they have an implicit bias towards simple functions as predicted by AIT. And this simplicity bias we think is a much more broad principle in nature and ought to be taught in physics curricula. We also said something which is quite controversial in the field, but we're pretty sure is right, which is the SGD itself is not the source of generalization, but it acts as a Bayesian um, optimizer. And of course, that many common intuitions from learning theory, ideas about bias, various trade off the idea that you should somehow simplify your parameters or limit your parameters um, are incorrect. But that doesn't mean that um, learning theory is inc incorrect. Just you got to do more sophisticated versions like our pack base bounds. Which, which seems to capture, um, the, the, capture at least numerically capture and, and also give us some deep intuitions about why neural networks work so well.
I just want to walk through the people that did this work. So Kamal and Chico were the ones that started out explaining to me how this, this um, how explained to me how uh, uh, simplicity bias worked. Guillermo is the one that taught me how neural networks work. Xiao Feng and Yun Su have just joined my group and are explaining to me how flatness works and how information geometry works. David was a, a, a visitor, or, or was not a visitor, is, a, is that's in stats, but helped us with a bunch of our proofs. Then Unz and Henry were two undergraduates or master students who Henry did the chaos and Unz has worked on, um, on double descent curves in Gaussian processes. And then Chris, Yor, Vlad and Isaac are four undergraduates from Hartford who did really extraordinary work. Um, and I've showed you some of their work. And one of the great exciting things about this field is that it's so wide and open that you know, undergraduates who are very smart and some of our undergraduates are very smart indeed, um, are able to make really you know, incredible breakthroughs um, and teach their supervisors something about something very exciting. So I wanna thank you for your attention and particularly thank all these collaborators who are of course the ones that did the actual work. And I'm happy to take some questions. Wonderful, fantastic. Thanks a lot for teaching us so much about all of those things. So if people have any questions, then please raise your hands and then we're going to take it from there. I see someone in the chat, someone's chatting. Yeah, you got a comment, which is... Okay, well, thank you very much. So maybe if, if there's no questions, let me go first then um, okay. until people can think of something. So you mentioned um, that, well, you showed empirically that SGD basically did the same thing as the, the Bayesian inference would do. And yes, do you think my question is, do you have any sense if that's only if that's sort of generally the case, if that's a general property of any optimization algorithm or if that's to do something with the structure of the object that's being optimized? So yeah. that's if that's sort of the properties of the neural networks playing in to make the statement hold true. Yeah, so, so the, the point is, um, what we're saying is it's a property fundamentally of the loss landscapes, okay? So, and, mm -hmm. and, and so what the AIT arguments tell us is that the basin volumes of these loss landscapes are gonna vary by many, many orders of magnitude. So basically, if, you're, if you have any kind of optimization technique um, and you're walking along, you're much more likely to fall into basins that are large and into basins that are small. So even though there are many functions that will give you a zero, error on your training sets, you're much more likely to fall into the simple ones. Now you may say, why does that matter? Well, that matters because the data that we're looking at is typically also simple, right? Um, and I showed that by varying the complexity of my, of my target set, which is basically like varying the complexity of my data. So this, should, this, will work, so this will work for any optimization technique that you can find. And for small systems, we, we, we can show that empirically you can do really stupid optimization where you just randomly sample parameters, but that just scales very badly. What, where SGD is very special is that it's an incredibly good optimizer. So it's, and particularly if you use some tweaks to it, um, say you use something like Adam or some, some, some hyperparameter tweak, it optimizes very well because it finds zero training solutions extremely efficiently. And that is super important. But the point is that just because it finds them very well doesn't tell you that it's finding the right ones with any fundamentally different than any other kind of optimizer. But we use it because it's efficient, not because it finds better solutions. That's the first order of the answer. The second order, what we all know is that we can tweak hyperparameters and get better generalization. Um, and that I would say is a much more subtle question. And that is probably often linked to, to details of how the, the landscape and the optimizer interact. And you can see that by changing the, the type of um, SGD that you use, which is many variants, and sometimes they work well on this system and on that system. You, you, and, and you know, if you're an engineer or you're actually trying to get something to work in practice, this is actually this is important because even a few percent difference in your generalization uh, performance can be really helpful. But fundamentally, why does the neural network pick a certain subset of functions from the hyper asking you know, large number of functions that it could pick because it's overparameter, it could pick a very large number of functions. That's the, the, the deep question. And that question is not answered by SGD. That answer is questioned by the structure of the landscape. Right. Why does this structure landscape help us? Because we're looking typically at structured data. That's the story in a nutshell. Nice, thanks. There is a question I see from Duncan who has raised his hand. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the fascinating talk. Um, so I'm 
interested in using um, uh, neural networks amongst other um, techniques for emulating processes in climate models, for example. And there, you know, we worry about the generalizability and, and robustness of, of these uh, emulators. And I was fascinated by the this idea of complexity. I hadn't come across it before. Sorry, chaotic um, behavior in neural networks. And so is there some way of diagnosing that? Can you can you find out that you're in this chaotic re regime that is not, you know, probably not finding the simplest solution and, and might not generalize so well? Yes, you, you actually, so if you look at the, uh, the, I cited one of the papers, but if you look at Yasha Solbixin's book last week, mm -hmm. and uh, a number of other people around him in that Google Brain group, and also some people at Stanford, they've written a whole series of very beautiful papers about this. And you can see this because, you know, in chaotic systems, you, we have a positive Lyapunov exponent. So you see that, and uh, you see positive Lyapunov exponents. Typically, your systems are hard to train. Yeah. Um, and so maybe another thing to say would be this, would be this. If you are interested in problem X, say climate, then to first order, what these neural networks are is they're, they're biased towards simplicity. But actually what you really want is a network that has the inductive bias towards the kind of problem that you're working on. So I gave you one example of the second order effects. So convolution neural networks, when you add pooling to them, that's been done to pick up some of the symmetries we know are there in images. And so that is something we know the images have that bias. So why don't we put that into our network so that it does that well on those images? And, and lo and behold, what you see is both the Bayesian prior and SGD are more likely to, to um, converge on functions or give you higher probability fun that on functions with lower error. Yep. So the question would be, if you're looking at something like climate physics, you know, it may very well be that vanilla neural networks don't have the right, they've got some bias, which is helpful, otherwise it wouldn't do something, but you might want to play with some of these ideas and get a neural network that has an intrinsic bias towards the kind of things that you're trying to solve. And so the, and, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work in that direction in, in the field. So it's, it, yeah, it'd be yeah, yeah. So I'm just giving you a language that the language is you want to have an inductive bias towards solutions that are good. Yeah. And so one, there's actually a really fascinating question that this also picks up, a more philosophical one, um, that uh, in fact Max Tugmark, who spoke here recently, has written about, which is. You know, why do neural networks work so well on in physics? And they, they work remarkably well in certain physical contexts. Um, well, my answer to that would be, that's because a lot of the things that we're studying in physics have fundamentally some kind of simple underlying effective theory. Right? Yeah. And so because neural networks are biased towards simplicity, they're finding these simple effective theories and that's why they work really well. And as long as that's true, they're gonna work really well. If you actually have something which is genuinely complex, like in certain, aspects of climate physics where you've got chaotic systems that are very sensitive to initial conditions, then that may not be a good bias, right? Um, yeah, thank you very much. I see there is uh, also, Gerard has uh, posted a question in the chat window, okay. which I'm attempting to read out so people can hear it. Um, so he writes, Papkin and Elad formulate neural network problems as a sparsity problem, where L2 misfit in L1 model is minimized. From this, they show that gradient formulae naturally have real functions. They also suggest deeper networks are equivalent to more iterations. Can you, yes, ask, so, do you yeah. see any relations between their work and yours? Yeah, yeah. So there is an extremely large literature by more mathematically orientated researchers that look for special properties of neural networks and often in terms of sparsity, in terms of matrix properties, in terms of a whole series of types of, of, of tools that they're used to. There are very powerful tools in, their, in those contexts. Um, um, I, my take on a lot of that work is that it's interesting, but it's not getting at what is special about neural networks. And that's because very often they're, they're, they're focused on you know, particular properties of, um, of, uh, of SGD. Now, this particular paper is not one that I am familiar with, um, but um, so what is true is that deeper neural networks are more expressive. That simply means that you can describe more functions with them, but that's not probably that important for them performing well, unless you're looking at a very complicated problem, right? because typically you're interested in the simpler functions, which smaller networks can, can do. But, you know, 
if you're looking at a very complicated problem, so a very complicated limit data set, then you might want a very big neural network, so a deeper network, something of that nature, because you need to be able to have access to, the, to complicated functions. Those are the kinds of things um, uh, um, that are important. But I think maybe this is something that, that you saw also in the, um, the paper by Lenka, which is that there, in this field, you have a large number of more mathematically orientated scientists who are very concerned about proving certain types of things. And I, I'm just guessing this paper is in that same category. Um, and then you've got a whole series of engineers that are just trying to make things work. And, the, and hopefully physicists can find their way a little bit in between. And what I was showing you today is a typical physicist kind of approach to this work was a little bit in between. Um, so trying to use some mathematical rigor where needed, but also avoiding it where we think it's not needed. I see some more questions up. Yeah, there's Jack, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for a very educational talk. I fear I may ask a very ignorant question coming off the back of it. I On the plot you question. have in your conclusion slide, I can't help but note that there are some functions that are to the other side of your bound. Does that mean they're overfitted? Yeah, so that, that, you mean down here, yeah? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a sampling ish issue. So basically, if you have a, a function which has very low probability, but you only sample it a few times, right? Then if it happens to appear, it, so it's just an artifact. If you if you sample longer, that goes away, basically. Yeah. So I, I haven't told you about this thing. So here I just show you upper bounds, right? So so what you see, this is a log probability versus an upper bound. So if I randomly sample parameters, the highest probability functions are the one close to the bound. But I do have these kind of low k, low p ones. So ones that have low complexity but nevertheless rare. Right? What we show, which is kind of interesting, is that these low k, low p ones are functions for which the set of inputs itself is highly structured. So actually we have a, another bound where we can, where we say the distance you are away from the bound is proportional to, is exactly equal to the number. So in, in log, in, if you put this in log two space and the number of bits you're away from the bounds is the number of orders of magnitude in, in, in powers of two that you're away is equal to the number of bits of information lower that your inputs are compared to random inputs. Your inputs, most inputs are random, and so the subset of them are not random, and you've got to pick those. And what that's really telling you is that this network is not completely universal. There are certain types of outputs that it finds hard to make. It only makes them for very structured inputs. So there's a lot of stuff of that nature that we're exploring at the moment, and, and it's telling us something about um, uh, theories of machines, right? You know, you, remember, you might remember that in, in computer science, you talk about hierarchy, you know, Chomsky hierarchy, you've got, you know, finite state machines at the bottom and universal true machines at the top. And as you walk up, um, there, there's certain, you can get more and more and more. You can, with a universal machine, you can do anything that's calculatable. With a finite state machine, you can only do a very su small subset of things. And so this is picking up something of that nature. Nice, thanks a lot. There is another question by Sonki, please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. First of all, um, appreciate all the references. Um, could you please, you said it already, but could you please elaborate um, what the work you were involved with that naturally led you to this? You mentioned evolution RNA mapping. That's right. Yeah. So the the history of this was always different from the history of which I, the, 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 the way I told the story. The history is that we were started looking at these mapping from RNA sequences to RNA structures. And what we found was that for every time that we tried it, that this mapping was very highly biased, very similar to this, okay? So certain structures were very likely to appear and certain structures were very unlikely to appear. And so what really happened was I saw that in these RNA maps, we then did the dynamics of these. So that if you think about evolution dynamics, it's also on some very complicated fitness landscape rather than a loss landscape, but it's very similar to what SGD is doing on a loss landscape, it's moving around, right? In some kind of stochastic way. And so, what we found about five, six years ago was that the RNAs that you see in nature are the RNAs that are likely to appear upon random sampling. And the argument that we made was, well, that's because these ones are much more likely to appear in the first place. So even if the network, even if the landscape is changing all the time over because the fitness landscape is not static, it's changing, right? You're still gonna get these with much more likelihood than others. It's a kind of entropic argument. They have much more entropy in, in sequence spaces. So you're more likely to land on them even if they may not be the fittest. So we have this paper we call this the arrival of the frequent, where we basically say frequent um, structures are much more likely to fix in nature than um, less frequent structures, even if their fitness is lower. 
because it's a, it's a kind of, it's not really an entropic argument, it's a kinetic argument, but it's linked. You can think of it almost like a free, you can very roughly think about this as like free fitness, right? Fitness is the, how likely you are to reproduce, but there's also how likely you are to appear in the first place, which is like the entropy term. And so what then happened is I then had my student Kamal, who's a mathematician, I said to him, look at this, can you give me an expo a, a general explanation for why this is? Because we saw it not only in this system, but in a wide range of, of, of biological systems, everything seems to shoot the same thing. And that's how we got into the algorithm information theory. And then, uh, so that's, that's the history of it. The history of it is that we started looking at this in um, biological systems and then realized that the mathematics of neural networks were extremely similar to the mathematics of these evolutionary systems. And so that, in fact, and the nice thing about them is it's much easier to get data than it is in evolutionary systems. And so that's why we started running off in that direction. Nice, thanks. There's Ed, who also has a question. Please go ahead. Hey, um, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I've just got another question about the uh, chaotic and ordered regimes. Yeah. So um, you've shown kind of as you go deep into the chaotic regime, you hurt the performance um, because you end up losing this bias. Um, I've also seen people advocating that you, well, I've seen people advocating that you should initialize on the boundary between the ordered and the chaotic regime. Yeah, because right. if you go deep into the ordered regime, then you get this kind of very flat loss landscape. And I was wondering if you'd looked into what happens if you go into the ordered regime from this, um, from this yeah, bias so, perspective. Yeah, yeah so the, the, the thing is, in the ordered regime, it doesn't seem to, so this is the, 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 the edge of chaos type arguments are popular arguments have been around in the biological literature also around people like Kaufman and others. And um, uh, so the first thing to note is that this order chaos only holds for certain types of nonlinearities like earth air functions or tench functions, not there for ReLU. And so it is something very specific to those kinds of nonlinearities. And typically we use ReLUs in practice, which is why it's not often that used. Um, but yeah, if you go too far into the order regime, then you have difficulty um, you may have difficulty um, converging as well. Go deep in the chaotic regime, we have explanation for why it doesn't work very well. It's also harder to train in that regime. Um, um, and so the, 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 the early argument by these, the, the Stanford and the, and the Google Brain groups on um, the chaotic systems that you just try to sit on the border between these. Um, but I don't think there's been enough empirical evidence to show that that is in fact the case. And given that we mainly use ReLUs for which this, this this um, phase transition doesn't exist. Um, it's somewhat less interesting, but I, you know, I think try it. You know, it could very well be the case that this is something important for us to keep in mind. Another question, I see. Arno, There's Arno yes, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, super interesting and so many different things to digest. Um, so I just wanted to ask you if you could maybe reiterate one of them that I found particularly interesting, which was on the um, marginal likelihood that turns up in the pack base bound as you kind of then derived it. Because, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something that was already hypothesized by David McKay that like the marginal likelihood is a good indicator of generalization, but not formalized like that. So could you maybe just explain a bit again how how it ended up in the pack base bound that you got there because that's super interesting I find. Okay so that's a bit of a longer story. I I, I can I don't have time right now to explain okay, how, it, how it comes out. But basically it comes out from the KL divergence um turns out to to, to reduce to the um the marginal likelihood. But you're right that David Mackay a long time ago said you know this is the, the really important thing to look at for generalization. And actually Andrew Gordon Wilson who is at NYU has written a, a series of very nice recent papers where he looks at this in more detail, the intuition that you really should be looking at the marginal likelihood. If you look at our, our um, long paper on bounds, the generalization paper, then uh, you can, if you go to my publication on our website, you'll see it, the link to it. We cite uh, Andrew Gordon Wilson's paper and we, we give it a bit of a wider um, set of um, descriptions for why marginal likelihood might be a good way of, of explaining something about the model. And what, what Andrew and what it says and what David Mackay, of course, said was that what, what the world likelihood is telling you is, is how the functions that you're producing and your, your implicit bias of the functions interact with the data. So it's, it's like a number that's giving you um, a combination of these two. And then the nice thing is in the, in the pack-based bounds, 
um, it, it falls out in this way. Um, at least for binary classification, which is what we've done before, it, it comes out, falls out. And so there's a very deep, interesting link there. Although the, you know, the pack base is not, it's not found in the Bayesian argument. It's a, it's a frequency argument, but out comes the, out comes the, um, the Bayesian, uh, um, post the Bayesian, the marginal likelihood. So there's something quite interesting there. Okay, fantastic. So thanks a lot, Art, for this very educational talk. Thanks a lot for taking the time to answer so many questions. Okay. And thanks a lot for the people who actually posed those questions. So I think that's the natural end for today. Thanks again and talk to you next week. All right. And thank you very much.